The Bose Museum, the creation of John and Josephine Bose in the 1860s and 70s, opened to the public in 1892. One of its most famous and magnificent exhibits is the Silver Swan. On the 4th of October 2021, four young conservator curators, author and curator David Rooney and the clockmaker conservator Matthew Reed, came together at the museum to investigate this automaton and ask, what is Swan? And what is its future? I got involved with uh, the horological trade when I was 20 and went through various uh, training schemes and ended up here in 2008 as part of a much larger capital grant scheme when the roof of the museum was being repaired and the silver gallery was being restored. And that was the first time the Swan had been fully disassembled since the early 1970s. We are now a larger group of people who have got a basic understanding of what it is from craftspeople through to curatorial storytellers, and that is incredibly healthy. Arrival for the start of five days of discovery. I think the really significant thing about this project is a group of people coming together to make collective observations and suggestions. So I think this project, and particularly the swan being such a significant object, it's really great that it's the object has had this opportunity to spark off such a range of conversations and ideas. Curators Jane Whittaker and Howard Coots introduce the museum and its archive. Uh, it was restored, I'm going to say, I, I think quite effectively about 30 or 40 years ago, but I believe we've now come to a certain second stage under uh, the guidance of Matthew Reed of looking at ways of keeping it going longer. Uh, I'm told that there are problems that the more you work it, the more you wear the, the chains down. But there's certain structural features I think Matthew Reed wants to look at with you and hopefully overcome because obviously we have to consider its future. Can Swan continue to be used and should it be continued to be used? And if it is, as in a kind of mechanical operation, then what do we need to do? Like almost every mechanism going, if you want to use it, just like your uh, petrol car engine, you need to maintain it. Uh, primarily, you need to attend to the lubrication. It's just the same thing with Swan. It's really important that more and more people get to engage closely with unique objects like the Silver Swan because there isn't just one answer to what, what to do with it, what stories to tell about it, whose stories to tell, and how those stories might be told. And certainly what I'm finding out as a non-technical curator this week is just how many technical options there are for the swan into the future. There's no one answer and there's no right answer. So surely the best outcome for the Swan and for Bose Museum and for the people of Barnard Castle and beyond is for more and more people to be in that conversation, thinking hard about what the Swan means and what it could do into the future. Dismantling the automaton to reveal its inner workings with as much precision and care with which they were fashioned. I think one of the big take-homes from today is it's definitely worth taking it apart to this stage because it's not, a, I mean, it's a job, but it's not like a massive job because you can just much more easily get to such a lot more. Whereas when I've done it before, I haven't dealt with the glass. I mean, I think what we should do is um, maybe, con I'm slightly tempted to leave that as it is, um, but tie this, not today, tomorrow, tie this forward onto there yep. and um, just so it can't flop back and then take off some of these caps because it's really cool to see where the five fusey chains all run up through here mm. uh, and then maybe one or two of these um, wheels because these are probably Merlin if anything's Merlin. It also just gives us this window of opportunity to look at the rest of the kind of philosophical 
uh, side of it, because ultimately it's what Swan means. And like any mechanism or dynamic historic object, Swan is a di different thing, and not just sort of loosely, but actually physically and philosophically totally different when it's working and when it's so-called static, so dynamic versus static. And I think those two ideas have become quite sort of polarised. It either runs or it doesn't run. And actually the world isn't like that. There are all sorts of grey areas, again, to do with interpretation essentially in storytelling, that mean that Swan can still work or operate, but it depends what you mean by work and operate. And again, part of this week has been beginning to explore those concepts because it's those grey area concepts that are actually going to be the future of the object. The, the uh, interim conclusion, is it that um, if it looks like Swan, it's Swan? And broadly, no, not entirely, not entirely, not entirely no. right. Because okay. if you put servos and digital stuff all in here, great idea. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> what Seth and I, at least, and yeah. maybe somebody else yeah. would say, then it's no longer it's no longer a swan. swan. It's yeah, no I, longer I, a two hundred and fifty year old swan. It's but a, it's, it's, okay, it's okay to power it by a wheelchair motor or some equipment. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not being well, Anna, Anna just said yeah. the equivalent of, the, of, of, of um, electric winding in a turret clock. You know, yeah, yeah. a 400, 500 year old turret clock that's got electric winding right, that okay. wakes up. That's the same as what we essentially... And, and you, the whole thing is running steam on compressed air, isn't it? Yeah, OK. Sure, if but there's a risk that you break something that's irreplaceable and unmakeable yeah, yeah, or whatever, yeah. then you yeah. go but, down that. But none of it is irreplaceable. Yeah. Well, it's all irreplaceable. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. You can it's all, that looks you can repair, yeah. you can repair yeah, yeah. or you make any component within that head or within that. I mean, obviously, head. there's a cost to it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, that's I, I, quite small. You could it? remake. Well, we yeah. discussed last night about making another, making a replica. I mean, you could do it. Yeah, people have asked me. I mean, not asked but, me to do it, but asked me how yeah. much it costs. Um, I think the biggest challenge with working on any object like this is the, the unknown. Um, whether that's the unknown because you're not familiar with the operation of it or the unknown because you don't know what kind of um, potential issues there are lying underneath as a result of wear or previous restoration. Um, but I think what made this really nice, this opportunity unusual, and, and uh, I guess in some ways a bit like when you're studying, it was the, the collaborative aspect of it and the fact that we were working as a team um, and we had Matthew as someone who could give his um, inside information and experience. Is there that a is kind of uh, sensor emergency stop thing? Two. There's a mechanical clutch, which you, is just adjustable, mm. and there's also a load limiting as well, electronic load limiting. Um, and there's also a mechanical fuse, so there's a brake fusing, so there's a clutch, a fuse and electric limiter as well. Have any of them been fired no. off yet? Not that I'm aware of, although I think um, the slipping clutch thing m may have, but all that happens there is the motor keeps driving until it naturally stops, okay. so it gets out of sync basically. Mm. Maintenance is not sexy. Yeah. You know, new galleries are, new projects are. Exactly. Yeah. You know, getting fundraising for something like this is great, but saying, oh, we need money to 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 Just like to give maintain ten years time things. to yeah. like, <laughs> come in and tinker. Yeah. You're you're absolutely right. One hundred percent. These things are never thought through. Well, they're thought through, but they say it's There's not, just no say, money it's not the, sexy. The money's not available. Uh, and I think you do that by opening it up and keeping the conversation, uh, conversation going mm. and making it super accessible and doing what we're doing this week by filming this discussion, but making, you know, you all go out and you recruit five people each and they recruit five people each and somebody manages that collective mind, which is another costly and big job. Mm rather than letting it all go cold. The swan is an interesting beast, for want of a better word, because um, what was alluring about it when it was first made is different to what's alluring about it now, I think, anyway. You know, when it was first created, the point of it was for audiences to be surprised, amazed, wowed, how how does that thing that is so clearly not a real swan behave just like a swan? But of course now, in the 21st century, we've got access to 
3D modeling, complex automaton in movies, and computer animation and that kind of thing. So when we see an imitation of life, we're not necessarily wowed by the imitation of life anymore. And I think um, what people are more impressed by is the mechanical feat that has allowed it. Um, and I think that's what's impressive to audiences now, whereas in the, you know, the time when it was made, it was more about the magic of like not knowing. Whereas now people are like, oh wow, they could do that 250 years ago. Well, I, I had no impression really of how it functions. So all of that's been a learning experience just to see the way. I've worked on some automata before, um, but nothing with such a complex uh, and smooth movement. So, I mean, that's all, all been entirely learning. It's been quite interesting to see um, the alterations that were made on it uh, in the 1960s and 70s um, and trying to get in the head of the person that was doing that and, and what, what they've done. So that's been quite a, you know, a novel thing to, you know, to sort of come across. Okay, so present, at present, the fish move broadly half the uh, length of the track that they used to do. My conjecture, and it's open to you know, negotiation, is that um, we're at the first phase of the operation of the swan, they're kind of here. And when we look underneath, we can see uh, steady pins and screw holes which I presume, and that again might be totally wrong, are something like marginal plants, or let's say they are for sake of argument. And as the swarm is looking round, or maybe even as a bit of a joke, when it turns its back and it's preening its feathers, they get confidence and they start to move out into the, uh, into the lagoon or whatever it is, stream, let's call it stream. And then what doesn't work at the moment is that at the very, because of the malalignment of the different lobes of the cam, is that at the very moment it lurches forward or dives forward and grabs one of them, um, the others obviously immediately shoot back. And that's not, um, you know, synchronized at the moment, but that's a kind of relatively minor point. So why is that? Well, the reason it is, I think, is because in that 19, late 1960s, early 1970s restoration, essentially all this um, double height water bearing bar, as I call it, was replaced. So I don't think any of this is 18th century, it's all BA screws and soft solder and so on. And when the, as we know as um, clock and watch makers, these pinions are all slightly different sizes, or there's a range of sizes, and therefore you can't take them off and swap them round. Um, which, is what's, which is what's happened. And um, so there's an issue here that the spacing, maybe there were thinner rods here or something, because there are some distinctly smaller um, pinion caps and there are some distinctly thinner rods were here because now the rods, the glass rods and the track, which is fixed, don't line up. So again, I conjecture that when this was all put back together in the early 1970s, what happened was there was a moment, right, okay, what we're gonna do here? Well, I can't remake all this. So all I can do realistically is to um, just make them move less. The Swan does all sorts of work. It's the icon of the museum. It represents uh, County Durham, all that kind of stuff, as well as the physical um, sort of operation that it's uh, capable of. And I would like to see um, an intense period of work where the swan isn't actually operating. And that can be brought about by making sure that this week doesn't go cold, that the conversations that have been started or perpetuated this week are kept going. And let's say in 18 months time, a couple of years time, there's, uh, everybody gets together again and we maybe have a state of the nation uh, sort of a symposium or something. Not only about swan, but about context and about all sorts of uh, dynamic objects and how they influence our lives and their stories. That would be my ultimate um, sort of dream, if you like, to see the people I've been involved with this week and others stood on stage or digitally, whatever it is, telling their stories um, as I'm doing now about my experience of Swan 
Yet Swan is there philosophically, it's there physically, but it's not being used on this daily basis because essentially that is just using it up and a good period of um, sort of active rest, if that doesn't sound uh, you know, too strange, is what I'd love to see. It seems to me as an outsider that there's a couple of main challenges facing the swan. The first is a, is a practical one. It's a, it's a working object and working objects need maintenance. They, they wear and they, they break down. And if we want to preserve as much of that machine from the past so that we can learn into the future, then there's a conversation about, frankly, how often it operates and under what circumstances. But there's a bigger challenge which feels like a huge opportunity, which is to think about how the story of the Bose Silver Swan can go far and wide. And now one obvious answer to that would be we live in a digital world now and there's so much that can be done um, online using videos, animations and similar things. So the challenge but the opportunity for the future is to think about the physical object and to think about how the object's story can be spread far and wide.